No, it's difficult to say that the World Cup has progressed has along expected lines. You know, more times than not, whenever people turn up to World Cup games or World Cup tournaments, they expect that the top eight test playing nation will automatically qualify to go into the quarterfinals and then through to the semifinals. That has not happened on so many occasions in the World Cup, so it's difficult to say whether expected lines are being taken or not. We have seen some teams, England for instance, Pakistan, another that seem as if they could easily have dropped out of the, the preliminary rounds. And we have seen some other teams that Ireland for instance that a lot of people didn't expect to do as well, doing reasonably well. What I am a little bit disappointed about, and I think most people is the fact that we haven't seen a lot of exciting games. The best games, as far as I can see, have been amongst the non-traditional teams. I don't want to say middles, the teams that most people don't look upon as the top teams in the world. I think we have had one game amongst the test playing nation that has been exciting, which is the Australia-New Zealand game recently. But that's the nature of one-day cricket. I think a lot of people get carried away with one-day cricket, thinking every game is exciting because it's so short and it's supposedly so action but But the true thing is that you don't get many exciting ones. Well, I wouldn't say bowlers provide more entertainment. I think the entertainment value is exactly how the game pans out. We have high-scoring games that have been entertaining where the batsmen have dominated. For instance, you have a a game 320 and a teller team will chase it down and get there or just fail to, to get there. And then you'll have low scoring games where the bowlers dominate. It's just a matter of how the game progresses and how it ends up. Batsmen can be very entertaining getting 400 runs if the other team gets close. If the other team doesn't get close, then it's a boring game. And similarly, with, with low scoring games, if one team gets bowled out for 150 and the other one knocks it off for two wickets, that's not really a close entertaining game either. They might have some entertaining incidents within the game, some fantastic pieces of bowling or some catching or fielding that's certainly brilliant. Similarly with batting, you might have some really exciting batting like A.B. De Villiers, for instance, when South Africa got 408. His batting was just totally exhilarating. But the game itself won't be exciting and entertaining unless it's a close fought game. Yes, when you kind of an even contest between bat and ball and both teams come down to having an, ex- an excellent chance of winning down into the last few overs, I think that those are the most entertaining games. Yes, well, that is the situation. You know, once a decision has been made, the ball then becomes dead. But what we have to look at is not just that decision. We, we have seen in recent times, a few things that have developed in the game because of the DRS system. Let me state first of all, though, that I am totally for the DRS system. I like the idea of the DRS system. There are certain aspects of it that I like more than others, but the DRS system on a whole, I think, is good for the game. What happened with the Anderson and Taylor situation was that it was the last ball that, well, it was nine wickets down. If, for instance, England needed one run or two runs to win the game, and someone, whether it was Anderson or Taylor, was giving out LBW, and he was not out on referral, it would have been difficult to say exactly what should then take place. If it's the last ball of the innings, and someone is giving out, the ball is dead. Now, if you needed runs to win the game, you have not scored those runs, those runs, even if the ball ricocheted off the pads, for instance, and went down to the boundary for four leg buys. The ball became dead as soon as the decision was made. So those four leg buys would have been null and void. That means the team batting would not have gotten the run that they needed to win. No, the person is not out, so it was a mistake by the umpire. On referral, it is reversed. But there are no balls left because that ball is a legitimate ball. What do you do under those circumstances? That is what they need to look at with different aspects of the DRS. Fine, if there was no DRS, it would have been all over. The batsman would have been given out, and that's it. But if you have a DRS where you can correct bad decisions, you also have to take instances like that into consideration. 
what then happens to a team that was punished by the bad call by the umpire? I don't know how to solve that problem, but that is something that I think the ICC or some body within the cricket committee or the cricket committee itself needs to look at to try and find a formula for working on something like that. The other thing that I've seen crop up with the DRS, a lot of the umpires have gotten quite lazy. I've been watching this World Cup and I've seen a lot of no balls that have not been called by the umpire because they have just not been paying attention to the front foot. When someone gets out, they quickly call for a replay to see if the ball was a delivery, which is fine because you don't want someone to be given out for, for a no ball. But what about the no balls that were not called, that the batting team is punished for by not receiving an extra delivery? We saw that yesterday in the game. I don't remember which game it was, but I think it was Pakistan. So many times no balls were bowled. The umpire did not call a no ball, and the batting team obviously then ends up being punished because they did not get to face another delivery with a free hit. So those are different aspects of the DRS system, which I again emphasize that I like the system, but there are little things, little bugs in it that I think need to be ironed out, and I, and I think people need to pay a great deal of attention to because it can cost teams win. No, you can't do it after the event. It, it's something that has to be done at the time. There is no way you can do it after the event and say, okay, there was a no ball, so what do you do? Go, award the team some runs for, for Mr. No Ball? You can't do that. It has to be done at the, on the, during the event at the point. I don't know if the third umpire can have a monitor in front of him that he can watch every ball to see if there are no balls or not. And if one is missed by the umpire, then calls down to the standing umpire and say, listen, you missed a no ball. That might be a solution. I don't know. But there has to be something done that can iron out those little flaws in the system. Yes, it, it is difficult because the, the amount of cricket that is being played now. And that is again something that can create a few problems, has created problems. The amount of cricket that you have the test nations playing now, it is difficult for them to fit in any more cricket that it, than what they are playing. Some of the associate teams need as much exposure as they possibly can. But possibly some of them do not need the exposure against the very best test playing nations because they will just get blown out of the water. They, you don't need that. You need them to be exposed to better cricket, yes, but better cricket or better teams than them that are just perhaps marginally above them, not to be blown out of the water. And again, that is something that the people responsible for the game need to look at. They need to sit down, look at it, come to a, a realistic conclusion as to how it can be worked out and then move forward with that. As for the teams appearing in the World Cup, no, I have been critical of that for many, many years. The first time I suggested that you had too many associate teams in the World Cup, some people agreed, some people didn't. As far as I'm concerned, if you have a competition whereby these associate teams, as they are referred to, compete for the privilege of being in the World Cup. I don't see why you need to have more than the finalists in the World Cup. If you weren't good enough to get to the finals of that associate competition, I find it difficult to then justify you being in the, in the World Cup. But then again, you could also say the way to go forward, if, you, if you're only going to have 10 teams in the World Cup, if you want to reduce it to 10 teams, is to have perhaps six top-ranked teams automatically qualifying, and then the four bottom-ranked teams, the test playing nations, that is, qualifying along with the associate teams. So if they can't beat the associate teams in this qualifying tournament, they don't belong there either. So that could also be a way of moving forward.